Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our program today. I'm Pastor Steve Green. This is Brighton Word of Faith Church. My wife Penny and I pastor here. Today is Sunday, November 5th. The theme we're on is Knowing the Father, and the title of our message is Understanding the Jews, Roman numeral 3. The reason why we're talking about the Jews is because they play a big role in the Bible, obviously. In the New Testament, they are a key reference point for us to understand our own relationship relationship with God. They are referred to numerous times by the New Testament writers, so it's going to be helpful to know who they are. Uh, one of the keys to understanding what is a Jew or who is a Jew is to, first of all, understand that um, that can be a difficult question. Once we understand the difficulties, then we can take steps to get past it. Uh, for example, uh, a Canadian. I'm a Canadian. Maybe all of the listeners today are Canadians. Um, it's a simple question to ask, what is a Canadian? Uh, the answer would typically be uh, somebody who is a Canadian citizen. There wouldn't be uh, an issue of ethnicity. We all have different ethnicities. There wouldn't be um, an issue of uh, religious affiliation because that has nothing to do with being a Canadian. Uh, it would just simply be, if I am a citizen of Canada, then I am a Canadian. So then that's a very simple question. Who is a Canadian? Uh, when we ask the question, who is a Jew, it becomes a much more complicated question. Two weeks ago, we started to look into this and we saw that there are biblically significant perspectives on Jewishness. So not only are there different perspectives, but many of them are biblically significant. They're in the Bible. And we looked at three of them in particular uh, two weeks ago. Number one, ethnic Jews. Number two, religious Jews. And number three, cultural Jews. They're all found in the Bible. Now, uh, very interesting, I thought, our study uh, <clears throat> ethnic Jews, for example, uh, in the eyes of the Israeli government, the modern Israeli government, a person could be 99% Jewish by ethnicity. Now, this is a distinct possibility. It isn't common, but nevertheless, a distinct possibility. A person could be 99% Jewish by ethnicity, but in the eyes of the Jewish state, they would not be a Jew. On the other hand, you could have somebody who is only 1% Jewish by ethnicity, and yet in the eyes of the Jewish uh, of the Israeli state, uh, they would be considered to be a Jew. So <laughs> there's an explanation behind that. If you're interested uh, and you didn't see the message two weeks ago, then I suggest uh, or recommend you go back and have a look at that. So there's the question of ethnicity that is involved in Jewishness. Then there's the question of what is a religious Jew. We saw that there was Orthodox Jew. There were in the world of religion. There are Orthodox. Ox Jews, there are Reformed Jews, there, um, in between there are conservative Jews. Uh, on one extreme there's ultra-Orthodox Jews, and so there can be quite a variation in terms of um, religious Jewishness. Uh, then there are cultural Jews, people that aren't necessarily uh, ethnic or religious Jews, but they they are a participant in Jewish society, they, um, they uh, are part of the culture. Uh, and there are other perspectives on Jewishness we could look at that we did not mention two weeks ago. Uh, a repentant Jew, or a covenant Jew, or a messianic Jew. These would be other areas to explore. A seventh area uh, in which a distinction is sometimes made is that some like to distinguish between the, the leadership of the Jews, historically, and the common Jewish people. Um, the distinction would be this, is that the evil that has been done has been perpetuated by the leadership um, and, the, and meanwhile the common folk um, have been much more innocent. Um, when people believe that, and I, that seventh distinction, I am not inclined to believe that. I believe there's a lot of scripture that speaks against that. When people do believe that, it's because they have an agenda in mind. There's a particular <laughs> theological um, approach they want to take, and I don't uh, follow that or believe in that. Um, there are literally dozens of ways these different perspectives on Jewishness can be ordered and arranged, and these different ways mathematically are called permutations. Permutations are the ordering and arrangement of different factors um, and the different um, 
results that come from different ways of ordering. Um, therefore, it is difficult to simply refer to the Jews because the question would be and legitimately be, who do you mean when you speak of the Jews? Um, it would be hard to just say the Jews uh, without clarifying that and then expect to be well understood. Fortunately, the New Testament goes into great detail on the issue of uh, the Jews and their relationship with God, where they stand with God. Obviously, the Old Testament does as well. Uh, and books, the books addressing this subject at length in the New Testament would include um, Matthew, John, Acts, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews, um, and then all, many more of the books in the New Testament um, also touch on the subject. So it's a very, very common subject. The subject occupies a lot of real estate, so to speak, in the New Testament uh, because, again, it's of great importance to us because the relationship God and the Jews becomes a reference point uh, for our own relationship with God. In particular, the reference point is this, and it's not a very nice one or a very good one. It is that um, th the way the Jews did relationship with God is not how we do it. So it's, it's that type of a reference point. But knowing what something not is can be just as useful as knowing what it is. For example, in 1 Corinthians 13, it's known as the love chapter. We read about love, the God kind of love. It endures long, it's patient and kind. We also read that it is not not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it, pays no attention to a suffered wrong. And so learning what something is not, in this case learning what love is not, helps us understand what it is. And, and seeing the Jews and how they did relationship with God and understanding that is not what we're to do, that becomes very helpful for us in recognizing the kind of relationship God wants to have with us. When we do this, and when the New Testament, it's really not us doing it, it's the New Testament doing it. When the New Testament does it, um, there is no prejudice or unkindness being directed at the Jews because the Gentiles, those of us who are Gentiles, maybe all of us listening today are Gentiles, um, we would do exactly the same thing. <laughs> in their shoes. So there's no distinction. We're not uh, creating any bad guys here. Uh, but really what the Bible does is reveal that all of us, according to the flesh, are the bad guys. And, and the Jews just become prototypical would be a good word to describe their role in the Bible. So uh, let's go back and look at uh, some scriptures and in more detail. Uh, we touched on this passage two weeks ago, but I want to go into more detail. It's Acts chapter 7 where Stephen is speaking before the Jews. Jewish Sanhedrin. This passage ends with G Stephen being martyred, um, <clears throat> but, but we won't get to that point, but we'll read different sections of verses uh, from this passage uh, because they, they again, they, they help take this potentially confusing issue of who is a Jew and, and what do we mean when we talk about the Jews, uh, particularly from a, in a spiritual context, um, and helps make it very simple. Uh, so starting in chapter 7, verse 25, for he uh, supposed, this is speaking of Moses now, and the context of this is when Moses uh, found two of his brethren in Egypt prior to the uh, uh, Israelites coming out of Egypt, when Moses came across uh, two of his countrymen, Israelites, who were um, who were uh, being badly treated by an Egyptian, and then Moses struck the Egyptian and killed him, and um, therefore in his mind he was saving his countrymen. So in verse uh, 25, for he supposed. And that's an excellent word. It's used a few times in the Bible. Uh, usually it's used when people are not thinking the right thing. Um, that he supposed. Uh, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. That is so often the case. And the next day he appeared to two of them uh, as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, men, uh, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Now these words, uh, there's only three of them present, uh, the two Israelites and Moses, and, and so it's a very, 
Uh, it could be viewed as a very small statement just made among uh, a total of three people, but as we'll see in this passage, it becomes a very significant question. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Now this Moses, uh, the, jumping ahead a few verses to verse uh, 35, this Moses whom they rejected saying, who made you a ruler and a judge is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand uh, of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. And so uh, God viewed Moses as a ruler and a deliverer, but the people, uh, at least these two to begin with, they did not recognize him. In verse 37, um, Stephen continues by saying, this is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. And so Moses here is um, prophesying of a coming Christ, uh, a prophet like him uh, from among the uh, Israelite people. And Moses said, him shall you hear. That's a extremely profound uh, prophecy because Moses is actually, uh, we, when we see it in the light of the New Testament, he's prophesying uh, of a person who now will become the authority in God's world instead of the very law that Moses introduces, the law of Moses. Um, that will no longer be the authority. So this is a, uh, a prophecy that is huge in its consequences. Um, and of course, this prophecy was originally given back in Deuteronomy 18. P, uh, Stephen here is simply repeating it. And then he goes on in verse 38. This is he, the same Moses, who was in the uh, congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. And so, um, in effect, uh, the same words were spoken to Moses, uh, not just from that one person uh, that day in Egypt, but now the entire congregation is saying to Egypt, who are you? Uh, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? In other words, they, they rejected Moses. Um, <clears throat> they rejected him um, that day in Egypt. They rejected him uh, at Mount Sinai. They rejected Moses uh, throughout their journeys through the wilderness. It was a continual thing. Um, <clears throat> Continuing now in verse 40, uh, they said back in verse 39, uh, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. That's a strong word, um, but it's the word that is used. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. And so now Stephen quotes out of Amos chapter 5. And, and it reads like this, Did you offer me, this is God speaking to the Israelites, did you offer me uh, slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch, that was a, a pagan god, and the altar of your god Remphan, images which you made to worship. And I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And so uh, this happened, carrying away to Babylon happened over 800 years later. <laughs> but, but from the beginning, this is what their destiny was. Um, they were rejecting Moses along the way. Um, <clears throat> and then in, in verse 51, uh, Pete Stephen continues, uh, and he's now um, addressing the Sanhedrin again. He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, that was Jesus, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. 
So that is just a loaded passage. That's giving uh, a New Testament perspective, one that's repeated multiple times, as we said, in many books of the New Testament. It's giving a New Testament perspective on what happened between God and the Jewish people. So again, they said to Moses, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? At Mount Sinai, they rejected him. Throughout the time in the wilderness, they rejected him. Throughout their whole history, uh, they rejected God. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Uh, him shall you hear. And, and so it, Mo, Jesus was like Moses in more ways than one, but in one way um, he was like uh, Moses in that in effect the Jewish people said to him, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? And they killed him. Wow. So again, this is very strong language, and it might be language a little stronger than what we're comfortable with, uh, but it is the truth. Uh, it's something that we have to adjust ourselves to, as we do in many ways, adjust ourselves to what the Word says, not according to our feelings or our natural thoughts or opinions, but to be people of the Word of God. That is the idea. And again, let me emphasize, um, we would have done exactly the same. Um, if somebody might accuse me of anti-Semitism by saying this, but it's not anti-Semitism. If anything, it's uh, anti anthropoism. <laughs> um, anthropos is the Greek word for uh, a human being. It's uh, anything we're talking about now is shining a light on and revealing the nature of humanity apart from God, apart from Jesus in particular. Um, in Acts chapter 3, we looked at this two weeks ago, and, it, and this runs along the same line. We've been reading out of Acts chapter 7. Uh, in Acts chapter 3, this is another uh, powerful passage. Uh, verse 22, For Moses truly said to the fathers, the, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. So um, Peter here is quoting the same thing as Stephen quoted later in Acts chapter 7. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. This is Peter uh, quoting from Deuteronomy um, 18. And it shall be in verse 23 of Acts 3, and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So what Peter does when he quotes from Deuteronomy 18, he then combines it with a quote uh, from Leviticus 23 talking about the Day of Atonement, the most sacred day on the Jewish calendar, uh, a day in which if a Jewish person defiled the Sabbath, uh, we're speaking of the Sabbath of the Day of Atonement, not a weekly Sabbath, but if a person defiled that Sabbath by working on that day, he would then be expelled from the people of Israel. He would not be, in a sense, he would not be a Jew any longer. Uh, now, you can't change your parents just because you sin. so in one sense, he would be still an ethnic Jew, but he would not be a covenant Jew. He would not be part of the covenant between God and Israel. And so what Peter is doing by combining those two verses is he's saying that if uh, a Jewish person, a follower of Moses, then does not accept Jesus at his coming, does not hear him in whatever and in everything he says, then that will be a sin that is equivalent to defiling the Day of Atonement and the person um, in not accepting Jesus, the Jewish person in not accepting Jesus, um, will no longer be a covenant Jew. Again, uh, extremely serious, ex extremely profound in its meaning. Um, and, and it is what is, as we read through the scriptures, what we're going to see again and again. Now, we come to what Jesus said in the Gospel of John. And uh, it's going to be very similar. And uh, we made reference to it a couple of weeks ago that uh, there were 16 different statements um, most of them, 12 of them by Jesus himself, most of them in the Gospel of John, and they were concerning this exact subject. And, and we're going to um, read through these, and we're going to read through all 16 of them. And that might be uh, 
fairly repetitive. There are 16 different verses, but they are speaking to the same thing. But that's part of what I believe we need to do today is just to rehearse how firm, how uh, repetitive, and this is just scratching the surface. This is not even most of what the New Testament has to say about it. It's just a, a fraction, but it shows the consistency and the um, the, the very, very strong emphasis that, that God places on this subject. So we'll start with Matthew 11, verse 27. This is Jesus speaking to the multitudes, Jewish multitudes. He said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, uh, Matthew 11:27, and no one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son reveals, wills to reveal Him. So the only way that a person can have um, knowledge of the Father, the only way a person can know the Father is through Jesus revealing the Father to them. Um, and so this is the nature of what we're going to be reading, how if, if a person, if we have the Son, then we have the Father. If we don't have the Son, we don't have the Father. And so what each of these verses is going to do is to emphasize the seriousness of any Jewish person who purports to be in covenant relationship with the Father and yet if they reject the Son, then in fact there is no relationship with the Father. Again, very profound, very serious, very sobering. Um, and again, and, and in some cases perhaps not what everybody wants to hear. Uh, but let's continue to read Luke chapter 10 and verse 16. This is Jesus speaking to uh, the 70 disciples who were all Jewish. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. And so where there is no relationship with Jesus, there is no relationship with the Father. Whoever rejects Jesus is also, uh, in the words of Jesus, is also rejecting the Father. John 3.36, and this is John the Baptist speaking to his disciples who again were Jewish. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. This is John 3.36, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. John 5, 23, this is Jesus speaking to the Jews who sought to kill him. Uh, verse, 5, verse 23 of chapter 5, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. John chapter 5, verses 38 to 39, again, Jesus speaking to the Jews who sought to kill him. But you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent, referring, Jesus is referring to himself, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, um, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Jesus is saying, if you believed your own um, Jewish scriptures, if you believed them, you would readily and quickly accept me. Uh, John 5, verses 45 to 47, same conversation. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. So, Again, there's this profound contradiction where, where according to the Jewish religion, they are trusting in Moses, they're believing in Moses, they are following Moses, but Jesus is saying Moses is the one who will accuse you because you are not believing what he said. Because G Moses said that there would be a prophet like him who would arise uh, from within you, and him shall you hear. Uh, <clears throat> Verse uh, 46 of that same passage, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Verse 47, But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? John chapter 6, verse 45, this is Jesus speaking to the Jewish people in the synagogue at Capernaum. And Jesus said, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 
Everyone who has truly learned from the Father comes to Jesus. If people are not coming to Jesus, obviously they have not learned from the Father. John chapter 8 and verse 19, Jesus to the Pharisees, Then they said to him, Where is your Father? And Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. In John 13, verse 20, Jesus speaking to his disciples, Most assuredly I say to you, He who receives, receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Uh, same conversation, John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Same conversation in John 15, verses 23 to 25. He who hates me hates my Father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have had no sin. But now they have seen and have also hated both me and my Father. Again, such strong language. Words like uh, reject, we read earlier, hate, we read now. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. To hate Jesus is to hate the Father. Um, a meaningful religion that, 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 that draws close to the Father, but not by way of Jesus, simply does not exist. Um, <clears throat> John 16, 3, same conversation. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. In 1 John now, um, three, four different quotations, uh, three from 1 John, one from 2 John. These are all the Apostle John to both Jewish and Gentile Christians. Uh, John says, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And so this is simply affirming, all these verses that we're reading are simply affirming uh, what we saw in uh, Stephen's address to the Sanhedrin. They're what we saw in Peter's uh, sermon that he preached in Acts chapter 3, um, is that there, there is no relationship between anybody and the Father unless it goes through the Son. If a person does not accept the Son, then they also are not accepting the Father. So this would apply to what and to whom? Well, in all of these passages we're reading, uh, it's being applied to the Jewish religion. Um, but it would apply equally to all other religions, wouldn't it? Anybody who purports or who um, claims to follow God, to have a relationship with God, to be connected with God, but is not doing it through Jesus, which would be all of the world religions, um, it, is, it is not true. It's... It's a fallacy that there is no connection with God whatsoever. It would go um, beyond that to all of the people in the world who uh, have no religion at all, um, but follow what they believe in their heart, in their mind to be the right thing, or try to follow, try to do, try to do the right thing, trying to be a good person, having a certain standard or set of standards, a certain code, maybe a personal code, a way to live, the things they, they do, the things they don't do. All of that would be claiming to have a certain morality, maybe even um, uh, some kind of uh, vague attachment to a higher power. <laughs> but um, but it would, they would all be without merit. They would all be a religion or different religions or different belief systems, even if they're not a religion, that have no connection with God whatsoever. I think uh, all these verses, what Jesus has said over and over again, is very clear. Uh, and so everything other than a relationship with God through Jesus is being lumped into uh, this this category that we're describing. So John again says, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. In chapter 5 and verse 10 of 1 John, he who believes in the Son has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. <laughs> this is this is this is God's witness of His Son. Uh, so so again, such strong language. We're we're using words um, like hate and reject and liar uh, to describe um, to describe the idea 
of having a connection with God apart from Jesus. Um, it's just not true. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. In chapter 5 and verse 12, just two verses later, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And finally, in 2 John chapter 1 and verse 9, Whoever trespasses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So I trust that that uh, that uh, I have not overburdened you <laughs> with this repetition, uh, but it's all to make a point. It's to clarify an issue and to make it uh, abundantly clear to clarify an issue that is sometimes confused. Years ago, and I'll finish with this story, years ago, maybe 20 years ago, I'm not sure exactly, but Penny and I, uh, we went to a meeting in Edmonton, about an hour from where we live, uh, a large meeting, um, Christian meeting, a uh, very large auditorium. There would have been hundreds uh, if not thousands of people there. It's, again, quite a long time ago. Um, I, I recall where in the auditorium we were sitting. Penny mentioned it to me the other day. She recalls the exact, I asked her where did we sit, and she said exactly where I thought. So we've got ourselves, you know, physically placed in the auditorium. I, I don't recall, I couldn't estimate how many people there, except it was a large auditorium with many, many people, a well-known speaker. And as they were speaking, uh, and they spoke for some length, it seemed to me that they were coming right up to saying something, uh, but then not saying it. And then they would speak a little while further, and it seemed like they would come right up to making a particular statement, but then not make it. It was the same statement each time. And this happened a number of times. And so by the time that message was over, my curiosity was provoked. <laughs> I, I, um, I did something I would normally do. Out of principle, uh, at a meeting like that, out of principle, I would normally not go to the front um, uh, because, I'm, you know, sometimes with not many people, maybe with a few people, you know, with a big name person, a, a well-known person, there can be, um, almost, it can be almost like Hollywood, almost like um, a, a feeling of celebrity. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, people might might gather around or crowd around and 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 I just you know don't think that's what it's about and so I would purposefully stay away but uh, I was my curiosity had been stimulated and and so I went to the front and there was not a crowd up there there was uh, I needed to wait for a few minutes to have an opportunity to ask the speaker the question I had in my mind um, there was three or four there were three or four people ahead of me um, and at the time uh, in my mind, it was just a matter of curiosity. I'll get to the question here in just a second. Um, but it was just a matter of curiosity. I didn't, I didn't see any controversy in it, or, or, or at least not much. I might have had a vague sense of controversy, but, but I, it's not something that I was um, disturbed by, and, and I sh probably should be a little embarrassed in saying that because um, I should have known better. Um, but at the time, it was just pure curiosity. So I waited and, and then I got my opportunity. So I, I spoke to the speaker and, and I said to them, um, are you saying that the Jews have a, a way to God separate from the way that we have, separate from our faith in Jesus. The Jews have a separate and distinct way of, um, of belonging to God, a separate and distinct way of going to heaven. Um, and then the speaker looked at me for several moments, and really that was my first clue that, that um, my question, um, maybe there was something about it. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what, but um, just the fact that they didn't give me an immediate answer, but they looked at me. Um, I can't say what they were thinking, but, but almost as if they were sizing me up, <laughs> wondering how straightforward they should be with their answer. Finally, after a few moments, uh, they said to me, yes, that is in fact what they are saying. Uh, so I thought, okay. And, and I had a follow-up question. Uh, again, I didn't digest this answer as fully as I should have at the time. Um, uh, my follow-up question was this, is, okay then, what Jews are we talking about? Are we talking about, and, and, and 
um, I gave a longer list earlier in this message, and but I, at that time I just wasn't aware of this things as I am today, <clears throat> and and I could only think of two different types of Jews, and so I said, are we talking about religious Jews or ethnic Jews? Um, these Jews who have a way to God, have a way to heaven, apart from the way that we practice, and um, and then the speaker said both, and so I said, okay and I just walked away. And really, and again, perhaps a bit to my shame, I didn't give it a lot of thought in the moment. Um, but then it wasn't long after that, in, in, in the ensuing years, so you know, more than a really short period of time, but in the following years, it became a real hot button topic. Um, it was a very controversial issue. It was like somebody lit a match and, and threw it on the subject and it burst into flame. And now there was a, at least in, in the circles that I'm in, perhaps the ones you're in, um, it became uh, a, a subject of a lot of dispute. Uh, and, it, and it was this exact issue of do the Jews have a separate way to God? Or another way of asking the question is, do they have a separate covenant with God? Uh, and, and there was a lot of controversy over it. Um, controversy not only in, among people as to what the truth was, but also controversy as to what various um, notable speakers on the subject, what they actually believed. Um, it began to be examined much more closely uh, and, and words and exact words began to be important. Well, did they say exactly this or did they say exactly that? And then it seemed like those people that were at the forefront of this movement to, to speak this about the Jews, they, they all kind of retreated a little bit. And I, I can't say I know what everybody all the time said, but it became more difficult to know exactly what they were saying because of the, of the great controversy that erupted. Uh, it's like people went back in their shell a little bit and didn't want to expose themselves. Uh, but, but I knew, <laughs> even while all this was happening, at least with regard to this one minister, I knew because they had said to my face exactly what they believed. And, um, and uh, so, so that's part of the reason why we're talking about it today, because the same issues, uh, even though this was 20 plus years ago, the same issues extend to today, um, the same confusions extend to today. And, and it isn't just this um, theoretical, theological, you know, discussion uh, that has nothing to do with our daily lives or has nothing to do with, you know, uh, us Gentiles here living in 21st century North America. It's not our issue. Um, it is our issue because it is such a huge New Testament issue and because it has a great impact on our perception of what covenant is and what it isn't. And it has, uh, therefore, uh, a big impact upon our relationship with God. It's important that we know, and it's important that we know the reasons behind what the Bible says. And so very clearly, uh, what the New Testament is saying in the verses that we looked at today um, is contradicting what that minister said to me that evening is that uh, where there is no relationship with God through Jesus, if Jesus is not part of the relationship, if Jesus is not Lord and Savior, uh, if we don't believe that He died on the cross for our sins and God raised Him from the dead and, and you must be born again, you must confess faith in Jesus, if, if we lack that, then very clearly, very plainly, very repeatedly, there is no relationship with God. There is no connection. Um, a person who of the Jewish religion who does not uh, acknowledge and yield and surrender to Jesus, um, uh, that person has committed a sin uh, on the same level as defiling the Day of Atonement and they um, are destroyed from among the people. And again, very serious, very sad. Um, possibly very emotional, very difficult perhaps to hear the words, but it is the truth. And uh, as difficult as it might be, it is so important to believe the truth because the truth is the only way to life, the only way to God, the only way to eternity with God. We need to believe the truth. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, hope that you join us again next week.